gratitude to our production crew here for their flexibility. The, we canceled the panel, but then reactivated the panel. And uh, we may cancel again here. We have to remain flexible in these times. And, and uh, part of that is being able to adapt. We're going to power forward and talk about the climate emergency. My name is Seth Bernard. I'm the executive director of Title Track. We work in clean water, racial equity, and youth empowerment. And we need clean water, we need racial equity, we need youth empowerment, and we need to address the climate emergency first and foremost and of the utmost to continue with civilization. I'm joined by dear friends and colleagues, Hans Voss, the executive director of the Groundwork Center for Resilient Communities. Yes. And Emily Magner, the Northern Michigan Regional Coordinator for the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. I'm gonna, uh, uh, yeah, look, look at you, so much energy. And uh, these panels are being recorded for podcasts and, and short videos, so shout out to the people uh, tuning in from the internet. Um, we uh, are here on Earthwork Farm on a very rainy day, a beautiful harvest gathering. Uh, I would like to allow Hans and Emily uh, the opportunity to speak a little bit about their own background, their organizations, and, uh, and what they as individuals and as organizations are doing to address the climate crisis. Okay, thank you very much, Seth. It's great to be here. Thank you all for showing up, listening in if you're under a tent. Uh, my name is Hans Voss. I'm the executive director of the Groundwork Center for Resilient Communities in Traverse City, formerly known as the Michigan Land Use Institute, if you go back a ways with us. Uh, our mission is to make more healthy, prosperous, walkable, livable communities on the planet. And I, I raise that broad mission because uh, walkability, density, local food systems, transportation options are all part of climate solutions. So we've been doing this for 25 years as an organization, uh, but interestingly, we've strategically backed away from using climate change as the vehicle for our program work. So we may be working on localizing the food system or even uh, weatherizing homes and advancing solar energy and looking at better ways to get around that are less carbon intensive. But up until the last couple years, we've actually specifically pulled back from uh, framing our work around climate solutions, even though every one of them is. And I, I raise it because I think that's changed. I think uh, the world, in our, our country at least, is finally waking up. Uh, the rest of the world has been woken for some time. But here in Michigan, we have a new governor, a new attorney general who talk uh, strongly and boldly about climate change. We have more business people who recognize that um, the economic future of Michigan is, and, and, and our country is at stake, and we've had so many horrible extreme weather events that I think the, uh, we've tipped, the issue is tipped, and uh, I'm excited about it because I think it, it raises uh, new energy and opens up new, new avenues for people to plug into good work, and that work can be, you know, at the state level, at the local level, in your community, or federal action, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Emily can talk about some of the the, um, the ways to plug in, but I'll just give you my frame and then we can share the mic and I can come back with some other thoughts perhaps, but um, from a perspective of an, a person working in the nonprofit environmental world for 25 years, I have never seen as much momentum coming towards these issues that we've been working on and a lot of the energy is coming around from people who want to be a part of the climate solution and there are so many ways to get involved. One quick thing I'll say because I know line five is an issue that's uh, in the center of, of people's concerns in this state and at this festival. Um, you know, there's, there's lots going on to shut down that pipeline under the Mackinac Straits. And we've been involved, Seth's been involved, Emily's been involved. But what's interesting uh, as it relates to climate is uh, the proposal to create a tunnel seems to be a solution for some folks who go, well, we, we're protecting the Great Lakes because we don't have a tunnel, we don't have a pipeline that's gonna break into the lakes. But uh, it's really also an opportunity to make a case that we don't need to build fossil fuel infrastructure when we need to transition to clean energy and be a part of the climate solution. So uh, 
you know, basically everything we do is a, is, a, is a climate issue, and the Line 5 issue is a climate issue. So stay with that issue. Stay involved. Uh, we're, we're winning. Uh, we see the end in sight, but a tunnel that creates a new pipeline to transport more tar sands oil is not a solution that makes sense. Shutting it down and looking to clean energy is the way to go. Okay, so that's me. I'm Hans. I'm going to pass it over to, back to Seth for, or to Emily. Yeah. Thanks, Hans. Well, my name is Emily Magner, and I'm here with the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. Uh, we are the largest um, nonpartisan political organization in the state that is focused on protecting our clean air, clean water, um, good governance, uh, government accountability, good stuff like that that helps make sure that we have the systems in place to make sure that we elect good leaders. And once they're in office, they're doing good work. Um, so as the Northern Michigan coordinator, I'm based out of Traverse City and I work with youth climate activists. I work with citizens in our community who want to see lawmakers elected who are going to be protecting our natural resources and addressing climate change. And um, we really do the on the ground work, engaging with our communities to make sure that our lawmakers hear us loud and clear when they're about to vote on these issues. Thank you, Emily and Hans. So climate change can be such an overwhelming thing for people to think about. And um, one thing that I've gotten into the practice of doing uh, in this work is, is just taking better care of myself. So I think it's worth it to actually talk right at the beginning about how you take care of yourselves in the midst of working so hard for a better future and studying facts that can be uh, really heavy to carry with you in your heart and in your mind. So I come to this work um, as a social worker, actually. I'm a political social worker or a macro social worker. And in that field, um, we're well aware that burnout is a really, really dangerous thing for our movements and for ourselves. And so you know, making sure that you find that balance in this work, um, whenever you're in social justice work, um, it can be really uh, heavy, emotionally draining. It can be you know, stuff to do at all times. And you know, when the work is so important, sometimes we have to take a minute to take care of ourselves so that we can continue to do this work. That's nice. Uh, I, I have a positive view of the world, kind of an optimist. Uh, there's a lot of data, a lot of trends that can put you in a very depressed state. Uh, but I think there's, there's health and power in action and doing something about it. And if you want to be effective as an advocate on climate or any other issue, you really have to be positive. If you're angry, your effectiveness is going to drop pretty quickly. So, um, yeah, there must we all need our certain tools for keeping our, our energy together on the inside. Um, and that takes different forms for different people. But once you get out there in the role as a citizen, as an advocate, whether it's your local town council or writing a letter to your congressman, uh, the spirit of solutions that can work and a positive attitude really does matter. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and there's something personally regenerating by being a part of a solution and bringing your best energy, even against stiff odds. And I just, I would add to that, you know, I think that feeling like we don't have solutions, feeling like problems are too big for us to solve, are not motivating emotions. And that the more we invest ourselves in finding solutions and linking arms with like-minded people, finding each other and doing the actions that are the most critical actions to take in such troubling times, helps a lot. Yeah. Feels a lot better. You can carry a lot more weight when you're not doing it alone. Thank you. So uh, I started studying the science of climate change when I was at University of Michigan in 2000. And the, the science is and always has been very strong. Anywhere you study uh, the way that weather changes over time, which is what climate is, you know, this is the weather, it's raining, but the average global temperature uh, from year to year is climate, and we see it steadily rising. We see the levels of CO2 steadily rising, uh, and uh, the world's leading climatologists like James Hansen have, uh, have been, you know, sounding the emergency for a long time. 
uh, and yet there's this opposition funded by the fossil fuel industry, uh, which are motivated by profit. These are very, very wealthy corporations that have millions to spend in propaganda to deny climate change. And a lot of very well-intentioned people are being misinformed and told that uh, this is a political issue. And I'm curious about the two of you. You're both very empathic, compassionate people who just have a genuine love for folks, for individuals. And I, I've seen both of you uh, really extend a lot of um, understanding to people with opposing viewpoints. So I'm curious if you could share a story or two about a conversation that you've had with someone who doesn't believe that climate change is real and, uh, and how that went and, and how you... Um, regulated you know your own emotions and and tried to um be strategic and empathic at the same time does that make sense you know i think the most important thing when we're talking to someone who disagrees with us is to understand that at the core of all of our beliefs we have the same core set of values that we may have different moral taste buds impacting how much we want to act on which values. But when we're talking to someone who fundamentally disagrees with us on any particular subject, we have to go to that conversation understanding that at the core of it, we have the, the same values. And what it's about is not debating. It's not about convincing someone that they're wrong. It's about asking open-ended questions. It's about not acting judgmental in that moment, even when it's especially when it's hardest. And, and being willing to have those conversations and asking people, you know, where did you learn about this? Asking them open-ended questions about how they came to believe what they believe and being willing to be vulnerable enough to share your own personal stories about how you have grown to believe what you believe is really the only way that these conversations ever end in a productive way. Thank you, Emily, that's beautiful, mm -hmm. really. Um, yeah, I have a fair number of uh, relationships that are uh, multifaceted for folks who are engaging in our work at the Groundwork Center that are not driven by climate or who don't believe in the climate emergency. Um, uh, it's not, you know, it's, as Emily said, don't try to convince them of anything, but hear, hear their perspectives and then look for agreement where there is. And, and, and in, in the climate issue, there's tons of agreement. If you have uh, bought some line that human beings are not causing climate and that's where you're at, then uh, you gotta get past that and talk about the benefits of the solutions to climate change, which is keeping energy dollars local, creating walkable communities, localizing the food system, better, better clean air and public health. I mean, there's so many things to connect on. And if you, get, if you st spend too much time in the fundamental conflict of climate science, then you're not going to get to those things. And if you do that conversation in a compassionate and, and respectful way, you can get right through it. We have plenty of people who are strong advocates for our programs, our climate policy, who are you know, not driven by climate change but see the other benefits, and I think that's really important. Thank you both. I, I like the way you framed it around you know, sharing core values but maybe having different moral taste buds. That's really something I'll try to keep in mind. And uh, Hans, you touched on um, just coming together around practical solutions that benefit everyone. Like it's not in anyone's interest to destroy our local economies and ecosystems. No one wants to do that, you know. And um, we've reached a, a point of no return where um, renewables are more practical than fossil fuels now. And uh, we're seeing the benefits of that. And so um, I'd like to invite Rick Evans to join us on the panel briefly. And while Rick makes his way up here, um, Rick is a, an energy specialist with the Groundwork Center. Uh, he provided the, the solar lights that we've enjoyed here at, at Harvest Gathering. Um, but uh, we have, in the past few years, seen a lot of wind investment in, in Michigan and some solar subsidies too. And the federal government has historically subsidized the fossil fuel industry at such a colossal level. Uh, billions of dollars have been spent to support the fossil fuel industry. And when we start to flip that around a little bit, 
and and uh, support solar and wind and actually have some of that dollar some of that money get reinvested we've seen some counties that historically may have not been um, extremely excited about renewables or or um, c come out in numbers to protest um, around the climate emergency but they're getting the benefits of community re reinvestment from solar and wind and, and it's showing up in their roads being fixed and their schools being well funded and these communities are are now speaking on a larger scale and we're seeing it throughout the Midwest, very, very big in Iowa. And then some of these big tech companies are coming to these places because they want solid renewable power. Uh, Google and Facebook setting up shop in, in uh, Iowa and big, big tech companies coming to Grand Rapids and places like that where they, they trust the mayor and, and uh, elected officials who uh, do that community reinvestment and, and they take it seriously. So Rick, if you could speak a little bit about your work and then after Rick, you talk about where we're at with renewables and maybe uh, macro and micro. So, you know, the larger picture of how renewables are looking on a bigger scale and where we're at in Michigan and with your work. And then if, if Emily, you could bounce that into LCV's work to shape policy, to educate voters and, and influence candidates. Um, and how all of us can come together, put up our own solar panels, and we can also uh, prop up the right leaders and, and uh, really push the ones who might not be on the right side to, to take a different stance. Is this one hot? Hey, there we go. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, my name is Rick Evans, Clean Energy Policy Specialist with the Groundwork Center. Uh, for resilient communities out of Traverse City. And uh, in a past life, uh, I was uh, basically an energy uh, efficiency and renewable energy consultant for homeowners, uh, everything from climbing around in attics to working with bigger scale systems, uh, utility scale systems. And one of the really exciting things I get to do at the Groundwork Center is working with communities. One of the first things we did was help uh, Traverse City as well as Petoskey set 100% renewable energy goals which that, you know, kind of going back to talking about drivers of change, um, having these communities, even if they don't exactly know how they're going to get there yet, uh, but setting those 100% renewable energy goals, whether it's actually a community or a school or a church or a home uh, or a business, that everyone can set a 100% renewable energy goal and then figure out a path to get there. So uh, one of the fun things I get to do is not only help them set some of those policies and, and ideas around setting those actual goals and passing those um, uh, you know, at city councils or whatnot, but then also then help working with community leaders and policy uh, enactors in trying to, how are we gonna get there then? Where, where is this stuff gonna go? Is it gonna go on roofs? Is it gonna go in parking lots and big fields? You know, micro big systems or really small systems. Um, and so there's a lot of great opportunities right now and it's really exciting to, the, there's a, a thirst for this stuff and now that the economics have really changed, uh, completely changed actually, I, I should say for full disclosure, I'm also on the board of directors with Great Lakes Energy. Um, the electric co-op here in Michigan, uh, the third largest electrical provider in the state. And uh, we're, you know, we get all of our power from Wolverine, which is leading the way, has been leading the way in the state for renewable energy. Um, I ran as they were trying to build a coal plant when I was first running, so I kind of ran as an anti-coal plant guy, just that clean energy solutions. And uh, I get to say now that since I'm on the board, now it says nothing to do with me actually, but I get to claim it nonetheless. <laughs> that coal plant didn't get built. They're, they're leading the way in renewables uh, in the state. And uh, uh, yes, very good stuff, exciting stuff. And so it really does, so again, that goes back to just uh, getting involved with those, those organizations and those community uh, places that you can plug in. You know, the board of directors at, you know, at, at co-ops, electric co-ops is, is a really direct way to connect. Um, kind of back it up a little bit, I guess, some of the, you know, going back to those 100% renewable energy goals. Uh, one of the things we're working with the municipalities around a lot of uh, Traverse City, Charlevoix, Petoskey, Harbor Springs, all going together um, as municipalities and buying some into some of these larger renewable energy systems, bringing that, bringing that cost uh, down for, uh, for the, the whole community to be able to build these big systems, but then while these companies are there building these really large systems, we can also then kind of do some price uh, buying aggregation to then, you know, some of the smaller uh, homeowners or businesses can kind of buy into that bigger share of the, of the panels when they're talking, you know, 10, 20, 100 megawatts of power um, versus just like a little 2,000 watt system at home or something. So anyway, so we're trying to work and navigate in those waters and try to connect those dots for people. Um, I kind of, I'm not sure what else you'd like me to cover, if that's kind of what you're thinking. That, because uh, there's just a ton going on. That's what, so I guess, you know, to re bring that back around that, 
you know, asking your utility, whoever you buy your electricity from, find out what their green rate is. Uh, they're, they're mandated to have a green rate. You can right now just purchase for a slight extra margin on your bill. You can support renewable energy. Uh, every one of us here has that option at every utility in the state. Um, and so to, to sign up for that 100% renewable energy or 50% or 25, whatever you can afford to do, it's usually a, just a couple bucks a month. Uh, and uh, that kind of gives them the incentive too. I tell the, the folks in my district uh, for Great Lakes Energy, it's much more powerful. My voice at the board table is much more powerful if you all are calling me and telling me and shooting me emails about what it is. It's not just me and my voice. It's, it's the collective. And that really does help. That, that's a tremendously powerful. We, I don't think they want us to know how powerful we are because really that, that it really comes down to uh, if we demand this stuff, they just, they, they're, you know, we own those systems ultimately. So uh, yes. Thank you, Rick. Keep up the good work, man. Rick, also, I, um, we, we talked about self-care and, and ways that we, uh, you know, take care of ourselves and keep ourselves going when we're uh, dealing with challenging situations and consuming um, troubling information. Is there anything you want to share that you do to keep yourself going? Yeah. So... As one can imagine, uh, most board of directors of uh, my, that's my personal experience with the, the most challenges as far as direct engagement with um, people of power, I guess, um, that have uh, had, you know, these power systems that have been built have been built, uh, you know, that work really well for the systems that they were designed by. Um, and uh, someone down at Maddie Circle, I, I wish I could remember who brought this up, but, uh, you know, we think, we say that, oh, the system is broken, uh, we need to fix it, and actually it's, you know, the system is actually working brilliantly for the people that designed it and that are using it, and uh, and that we actually need to break that system to some degree in order to rebuild it. And uh, but at the same time, a lot of this infrastructure has already exists to be there. And so, fast forward or back up, maybe a couple years ago, I was kind of pushing our, our uh, around the, our board table of you know how do we really kind of get out in front of this stuff instead of being so reactionary. And it's getting a lot of kickback. And uh, I've kind of learned to, to ask the, you know, our VPs some questions instead of uh, the other board members. And if I can get them to say it instead of me saying it, that's been a really effective way to get, you know, and so we've got this young VP uh, of engineering, super bright guy. And I was asking him about what does it look like, you know, if all of a sudden everybody tomorrow was 50% using less, you know, 50% less energy and they had, uh, you know, 5,000 watts on their house. And what would that look like for our, how would we keep our lights on and how would we manage and he, you know, what does that look like in the future to you uh, as our head engineer at this third largest electrical company in, in the state? And he said, man, I'm actually really excited. Uh, I think in the future, within five to 10, maybe 15 years, we're not really going to be energy company per se. We're just going to be the, the organization and the facilities to engage in the trading of this energy. So that if Bill across the street has his big solar system, but he's gone for the weekend, you can get online and the neighbor can buy that power from him. The, po the power companies are just going to be the, the transitional, kind of the, uh, the, the traders in the betweeners. And, uh, and so, to, you know, there's really some exciting things coming. And I say that in the context of that, having some people of power that are looking forward uh, uh, beyond what we're at in the systems that we're at now can just alleviate a lot of pressure on, again, going back to whether it's climate or clean energy forever in the utility world, as you can imagine, we've been told it's, it's too expensive, it's not effective, it's not, you can't just turn it on whenever we want, and so therefore it's bad. And then all of a sudden now it's the cheapest thing out there, so now they gotta tell us it's good. So they're in this weird spot of telling us for decades that stuff doesn't work and it's not effective, and then all of a sudden now it's the cheapest thing and they're buying it like crazy and they're being you know, forced upon them to some degree. Uh, but it is the most cost effective. So they themselves actually need help with this and need education on this stuff because they don't know. They know Ohm's law has been the same thing for 100 years. You know, you put X amount of juice on the line from one spot and you got to send it to the other end. Um, so they, that's what they know. But we need to then kind of lean on them and say, hey, there are other ways to do this and, and we demand this of you. And uh, I think that does wind up uh, taking it down a notch enough that they really do understand it kind of on a more personal level and they all get it like you said nobody wants to make clean air or, or dirty air dirty water dirty soil that's not but that's kind of what our systems have led us to when you get it back down to that level of understanding the really root of a lot of these things that that's absolutely where that common ground happens and uh that's that's where it's gonna that's where everybody can meet up on that for sure right on yeah common ground and music is such a great example of that I, I have been very successful in having conversations about music with people that kind of uh, opens up the door to have maybe some more challenging conversations in a nicer way. Uh, Emily, let's talk about policy. Let's talk about governance and, and the way that LCV has done such a tremendous job um, 
in uh, informing the public and influencing candidates? So we are an organization that has staff and policy experts in Lansing, and we are all over the state. We've got, uh, we've got Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids, Detroit, Traverse City, and what all of these different moving pieces do together is they unite to harness our voices. So when our policy experts are on the floor in Lansing and they hear that your lawmaker is about to vote against clean energy, your lawmaker is about to vote against clean water, they tell us in our different regions and we call you. Because what this is about, I think something that you said really brought this up for me, is we need to re-examine our relationship with power. At the end of the day, we need to re-examine our own power because the systems that we exist in are not built for us to feel powerful. You know, I work with a lot of young people who can't vote and they get it. They show up, they know at the end of the day, we do not have the ability as good ethical people to say any longer, I'm not political. Because the powers that be have taken non-political issues and politicized them. And so whenever we say I'm not political, if you are a human on this earth who drinks water, who loves people, you are a political person. And we need to harness that power right now. Because when we tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, it's time to let your lawmaker know that this isn't acceptable. If they are going to vote to harm us, to harm our environment, to harm our future, they need to hear us loud and clear. They need to know. It can't just be one pe person sitting at that table saying this is important. It can't just be the, the policy experts in Lansing. It has to be every single one of us in our homes understanding our own personal power to be creating a change. And I want you to know that if you are under the age of 18 and listening to this, you're only less powerful on this front a couple days a year when it's voting day. Yeah. Because every other day of the year, we need to be making ourselves heard. And I mean, again, I work with a lot of young people. I'm looking at a clump of them right there. Hey. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Your voices matter more than anything. You are the David of the David and Goliath of climate change. These lawmakers who count, who count on ignoring us, who count on the systems that rely on enforcing that our votes don't matter. They do. We have to fundamentally change who is in power, and that means we have to fundamentally understand that we are a whole lot more powerful than we think because they've got to go. The, the answers are there, the solutions are there, and it just means that all of us who would say, I would never phone bank, I would never canvas, I would never knock on doors, I would never do that, guess what? We can't just know what the right thing is to do. It's not enough anymore. We aren't at that place anymore. Now we are at a place where we have to fundamentally change who is in power, and the only way that we can do that is by understanding that we are powerful, whether or not we can vote. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to back that up with something. Way to go, Emily. Um, <laughs> really strong. So the thing about it is, the League of Conservation Voters is a, is a C4, 501C4 organization. So lots of the ways you can engage is through the political process. And Emily's organization, Michigan League of Conservation Voters, does education on the 501C3 side, which is what Groundwork does, and lots of strong environmental groups. But they also do political organizing and have a PAC to help get elected uh, better uh, leaders and give you a way to get involved. So. There's lots of ways to like take this forward, but one of them is get on the Michigan League of Conservation uh, Voters uh, list, and Emily will tune you in about how to get involved. Or if you live in another region, you know there's other regional reps of the organization. So uh, political power comes with political action and really strong organizations and leaders like LCV and, and Emily. Thank you. Hans. Uh, would you be willing to tell the story of the first campaign that got the Michigan Land Use Institute started? I think it's an amazing story. And you, what made me think of it is uh, the David and Goliath metaphor. Because years later, that same metaphor was, was brought up. 
Okay, Would you be willing I'll to share that? I'll tell you the story. All right. Okay, so uh, the Michigan landing since you started in 1995, and that was a time when northern Michigan, the northern lower peninsula, was the most active natural gas drilling uh, development field in the country. The Antrim Shale natural gas was something that the industry had looked over for many years, but they realized with new technology they could go back in with a very intensive form of extraction, which was uh, really changing the landscape of our state forests in the northern lower peninsula. And the state of Michigan at that time really didn't have a sense for how to oversee it properly, nor much of a will to do so. So this startup organization called the Michigan Land Use Institute started a campaign to take on the oil and gas industry and provide better rules and regulations for how to develop natural gas in a way that doesn't screw up the landscape and the environment. And uh, we raised hell. We had a real campaign. It was tremendous. I was too young to know any better. I was all in. Uh, we had lots of partners in the conservation community, hunting and fishing groups, farmers that were, um, you know, not benefiting as much as they should from these leases that were coming at them for natural gas. So there's a hotbed of, of discussion about that. We had big public debates about it. John Engler was the governor. He didn't have much of an interest in, in improving environmental regulations, but we put so much pressure on them through a media campaign and through lots of grassroots organizing that Governor Engler came around and and the DEQ made better rules. But the story, one of the stories which I find fascinating, was we did so many town hall meetings, so many public debates with the oil industry, you know, people from the Michigan Oil and Gas Associations in suits who were trained for this, and then our side, which was a little less refined, but uh, pretty, pretty motivated. And uh, we had a, an event in Hillman, Michigan at the high school. Hillman's over kind of near Gaylord, little town. There must have been 600 people in the high school, and it was a very intense, uh, kind of scary environment because there was a lot of people from the oil industry who were there and a lot of angry farmers who weren't get, feeling like they were getting a fair deal, a lot of environmentalists. And I'm the speaker. I'm 27 years old, and I'm kind of advocating against the guy who is the owner of Terra Energy, uh, who was the biggest company in the business. And the story is, we always carried ourselves with respect and composure and clear, strong facts. And we, and we made a case vigorously, but always uh, respectfully, and always brought a solution for how we think it can be done better. We never said you can't do natural gas development. We just said we have to do a better job and protect these other resources. And we carried ourselves with, with grace and, and with respect for ourselves and our opponents. And ultimately, we really made a big difference. I, I wouldn't say we won everything, but we changed the way natural gas development happened in Michigan. And this guy who owned um, Terra Energy got out of it and got into, over the next 10 years, got into uh, renewable energy, which is kind of an interesting story. And uh, he's from the UP, very, very interesting guy. And I saw him about 10 years later at a coffee shop. And uh, he's like, hey, oh, it's good to see you. And I'm like, hey, good to see you. <laughs> and... Uh, I was like, well, this is interesting. I wonder how this is going to go. And he goes, I wanted to always tell you, Hans, I thought you were a very uh, strong and fair opponent, and I never lost respect for you at Keith of the organization. You were tough. And he said, sometimes I feel like it was a David and Goliath story. I'm like, yeah, me too. He said, I felt like I was David and you were Goliath. <laughs> so, that, so, that, so that was a pretty good laugh. <laughs> yeah. I love that story. And it, and it started with just a few people. You know, coming up with this idea, we want to protect protect the Jordan River. We want to we want to uh, figure out how we can change policy. And you find a, a lawmaker that's sympathetic, and you draft up legislation. You put this grassroots campaign together, and uh, and it works. You know, it doesn't work every time, and you can't expect it to work every time. But you put everything you've got into it every time. And um, I have so much respect for the three of you. Thank you all so much for uh, being a part of this discussion. Um, I, uh, I'm not going to be able to join the next step, the interactive part of it, but it's going to take place in healing and wellness um, instead of Maddie's circle. So we have an alternative to the rain uh, situation. Uh, but I, to that same, you know, um, in that same sort of narrative where, where things can, can start really small and, and turn into a giant groundswell, it was one year ago that Greta Thunberg, uh, Greta, from Sweden did a one person climate strike by herself. And one year later, 4 million people across the world on this Friday uh, did a general strike for climate. And uh, the possibilities are endless. And um, I think uh, 
it'll be very refreshing for us to move out of this paradigm of a constant power struggle uh, into a paradigm of, of healing, of cultural healing. And uh, addressing the climate emergency is, is forcing us uh, to, to face this and to, uh, and to do this work and engage in this work. So we encourage all of you to join the discussion, join the work, uh, help the helpers, uh, be bold, be courageous, make a stand, and also be creative. And one of the things that uh, Title Track uh, encourages is art and creativity. And I think all of, the, all of the work that all of us do is buoyed by creativity, is lifted up and, and made more visible and vibrant when there are uh, music makers and, and dancers and, and painters and uh, communities coming together to, to sing and to, and to create art together. Um, so so um, we hope that this panel has been beneficial to you. Thank you for showing up. How about a hand for all the panelists? Hans Voss, Emily Magner, Rick Evans. Go ahead and visit Michigan League of Conservation Voters and Groundwork Center for Resilient Communities on the Internet and make a generous tax-deductible donation. You'll feel great about it. Have a great day, everybody. Keep up the good work.